An alarming series of incidents beginning in the immediate aftermath of Donald Trump's election victory is compounding the fear, fear that many in this country have about their futures. And it's sparking a conversation about how best to push back against a potential wave of hate. The FBI is reporting over the weekend that a series of threatening text messages were sent to high school students and people in Latino and LGBTQ communities. FBI saying this, quote, some recipients reported being told they were selected for deportation or to report to a re-education camp. The messages have also been reported as being received via email communication. That is after text messages were sent to black Americans in more than a dozen states after the election. The New York Times reports that the messages, quote, told them they had, to, they had been selected to pick cotton and order them to report for slavery. Some of the messages also made a reference to Mr. Trump. Some even claimed to be from his administration. But a campaign spokesperson said it had absolutely nothing to do with those text messages. The New York Times adds this reporting, quote, misogynistic social media posts also surged in the aftermath of the election with phrases like your body, my choice and get back to the kitchen proliferating online. The threats are not happening in a vacuum, of course. They come at a time when Latino communities are fearing what could happen if the Trump administration follows through on those promised mass deportations. The LGBTQ plus community right now fearing a rollback of legal protections and rights on the part of the Trump administration and maybe even the Supreme Court. Not to mention, this is a moment in which many black Americans fear a rollback of civil rights. Add to that a moment in which women are anticipating almost girding for a further erosion of their bodily autonomy in a post Dobbs America. All of it naturally leading to a question that millions of Americans have a right to ask, which is this. What does the resistance against hate in America look like if many of the institutions that have traditionally been a bulwark in protecting Americans are now in the hands of the Trump administration? For example, would a Trump Justice Department led by an Attorney General Matt Gates, be active in combating hate? Would it do the same kind of job the Biden administration has done? On that, the AP reports this, quote, Justice Department employees were already preparing for a major shakeup to the agency's agenda around civil rights and other matters before Trump settled on Gates to be the nation's top federal law enforcement officer. Donald Trump has also chosen Brendan Carr to lead the Federal Communications Commission, that agency responsible for the regulation of the media, among other things. On that, the Washington Post reports this, quote, Carr wrote in the FCC section of Project 2025 that big tech posed a threat through its attempts to drive diverse political viewpoints from the digital town square. In other words, Carr is peddling the notion that conservatives are the ones being silenced on social media platforms. And many hear that he will advocate for changes that would allow for even more hate speech to flourish on the Internet. Once again, from The Washington Post, quote, Carr's appointment drew criticism from left leaning groups, including the Chamber of Progress, which posted on X on Sunday that if he were confirmed, it would be up to Democrats to defend a content moderation protection policy that keeps the Internet from becoming a cesspool. Countering hate in the next chapter of the Trump era is where we begin today. Civil rights attorney and president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, Maya Wiley's here. Also joining us, former assistant director of counterintelligence at the FBI, MSNBC national security analyst, Frank Figluzzi is here. But we're going to first bring in Democratic Congressman from California, Robert Garcia. He sits on the House Oversight and Homeland Security Committees. Congressman, thank you for being here. What is your understanding or have you had access to any um, briefings from the FBI about the hate messages sent via text and email? Well, those conversations are actually um, just starting. It, it is incredibly concerning, um, especially to uh, House Democrats here in Congress, all of us on oversight on Homeland Security. Uh, these are threats that are being sent, not just to LGBTQ young people, but to black Americans, to women. Uh, and it should be very concerning 
uh, to all of us. We don't know where these threats are exactly coming from. We do know that these phone numbers, uh, these cell phones, these emails are being purchased en masse, and then these horrific messages are actually being sent. But what I also think it's important for us to remember and to note is that when you have a candidate for president, that spends and has spent the last couple of years saying that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country or demeaning women or demeaning working people, this is the result that you're going to get, is there are people that are now in power that hateful messages actually are not going to be pushed back in this country, that somehow people can get away with this type of behavior and harming others. And so it's very important at this moment that yes, we had an election and yes, a lot of us are feeling defeated about the moment, we have to push back and fight against this. And in no circumstance should we allow people to receive these types of messages and not investigate it. I mean, I'm thinking about the efforts, and I, and I remember them being somewhat bipartisan, to confront some social media companies about the impact on young girls of some of the hideous content online. I mean, would you rule out trying to form a bipartisan effort? to at least get to the bottom of where the hateful messages are coming from, which so far have targeted black Americans, Latino Americans, LGBTQ plus Americans and females? I mean, 100 percent. We would love to see Republicans come to the table uh, in a bipartisan way and investigate where this is actually coming from. I mean, so far, there has been zero to little interest. I mean, at this point, um, Republicans in the House want to do whatever Donald Trump commands them to do. And so uh, this is very dangerous. It's important to note that we are seeing also young people, young LGBTQ plus people who are literally scared. We're seeing much more need to also support them. We're seeing call lines, the suicide hotlines shoot up. We're seeing our organizations on the ground, seeing more and more people actually visiting them, calling, desperately seeking help and advice. And so this is actually having an impact on real lives. So yes, Republicans should come to the table and work with us on these issues. But unfortunately, I'm also not holding my breath. They seem very uninterested to do anything productive at this moment, except for help Donald Trump. Let me read the reporting on, on what you're talking about, Congressman, from the Washington Post, quote, calls to LGBTQ plus crisis lines surged following Trump's election day victory, with callers expressing feelings of isolation, as well as fears that they would lose access to gender affirming health care or experience physical violence because of their gender or sexual identity. The Trevor Project, a nonprofit focused on support and suicide prevention among LGBTQ plus youth, said a third of its crisis calls immediately before and after election day were from LGBTQ plus youth who are also racial and ethnic minorities. Um, what can you do? What can folks do um, to protect people again who are the most vulnerable right now? I would say, when I, and I've actually talked to some, um, some LGBTQ plus youth groups. I'm uh, gay myself. I've told them and I tell others that we're here to protect and to fight for you and that, yes, this is a very difficult moment. But what we're not going to do is somehow discard our belief in civil rights and the rights of all people. We're not going to somehow not fight and stand up for trans families and young people and gay people. These are core values that we should have, not just as Democrats, but as good human beings and good people. And so while the other party now in the majority want to attack and belittle and bully, I think it's really important that at this moment that we stand up for these groups. And by the way, when you're attacking gay kids, trans kids, these are children. These are kids that we're talking about with families. They should be, not be bullied, they should not be attacked, and everyone of good conscience and goodwill should be standing up for them. How, what is the plan to stand up for your own colleague who's been targeted by Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace? Let me read the, uh, my colleagues reporting here at NBC News about this. Congresswoman Nancy Mace said Tuesday that her effort to ban transgender women from using female bathrooms at the U.S. Capitol is a direct response to the election of Sarah McBride, who was set to be the first openly transgender person in Congress. She was asked by reporters Tuesday if the move was in response to McBride, quote, Yes, and absolutely, and then some, Mace told reporters, adding, quote, I'm absolutely 100 percent gonna stand in the way of any man who wants to be in a women's restroom, in our locker rooms, in our changing rooms. I will be there fighting you every step of the way. So that's happening up there. What is the plan? I, I, honestly, first, I, I am disgusted by those vile comments and these efforts 
why we are focusing on singling out one member, one new member, a freshman member of this body now, and why we're policing that person and where they use the restroom um, is, is shameful. And we should push back on this disgusting rhetoric and actions. Uh, Sarah McBride has the support of our entire caucus and clearly of the people of Delaware who sent her here to represent them. We should allow her to legislate. And so this attacking of a member, um, I think, is, is is gross, and it's and which should bother us also that this is the first thing that this House majority is focused on. They're not talking about lowering the cost of groceries. They're not talking about making housing more affordable. They are policing where someone uses the restroom. And unfortunately, this is the kind of vile behavior that we should expect from them. And hopefully, we can just continue to stand up and not allow our values to move backwards. So we stand 100% behind Sarah, and she's going to be an incredible legislator.